Welcome to Peak Mind. I'm your host, Michael Trainer, and I'm extremely excited for this week's episode with Robert Augustus Masters. I met Robert a few years back and did some extremely deep work with him around healing, around masculinity, around the paradigm of the mature masculine, some deep work into shadow and trauma and wounds. And it was a sea change for me, truly life changing. And this episode is definitely deeply personal. It's one of my favorite episodes thus far. Uh, Robert is a a treasure trove of information. He's written over 14 books. He's written books on spiritual bypassing. He wrote a book, which is largely the focus of this episode, called To Be a Man. He works with groups of men and groups of women around uh, moving through uh, limiting beliefs, deep traumas, and really tapping into uh, and through the shadow into one's true possibility. So I had a profound experience with him. I I went there with uh, my friend Connor Beaton uh, from Man Talks and Mark Groves from Create the Love, and we did a really deep, immersive uh, men's group, uh, about eight men. And I did some really profound work around some deep-seated, repressed anger um, over a failed uh, and broken partnership and some deep grieving um, over my father's diagnosis uh, with dementia. And that confrontation, while extraordinarily challenging, proved to be uh, a very, very strong gift in my life. So I hope that his words are a gift in your life. If you're finding value in the podcast, please go ahead and leave us a rating and review. I'm so grateful we just surpassed uh, 200 rating and reviews, uh, 98 or 99% of which are five-star reviews. It means the world to me. Thank you so much. Any direct feedback is always welcome. I'm at Michael Trainer on Instagram or any of the social channels. And with that, I'd like to uh, spread some gratitude for our, our two partners and sponsors on this episode. The first I'd like to shout out is one of my favorite uh, companies, Juve. Juve is a red light therapy device. I actually just did an interview with one of their founders, Scott Nelson, which is a treasure trove of information into the efficacy of red light. It's been blowing my mind. I've been using my Juve now for several months. I, I use it as part of my morning meditation and sometimes before bed. But it, the, the benefits of, of red light are well documented. You can go on PubMed. I've been using light uh, since college, actually, when I was I had SAD, seasonal affective disorder, and found that uh, light sort of brought me back to where I needed to be in terms of my mood. But now I've seen the benefits in terms of skin and collagen production, uh, hormonal effects uh, for men, uh, and, and testosterone production for women. Um, also uh, hormonal benefits. Scott actually breaks it down to great effect. So I highly recommend you check out that Mind Key episode with Scott Nelson if you haven't already. And Juve has been gracious enough to offer uh, Peak Mind listeners a, a nice discount. So if you check out Juve, it's www.joovv.com. That's joovv.com. And put in Peak Mind at checkout. You'll get a nice discount. Uh, even if you just want to check it out for the time being and, and delve deeply into the research, it's chock full of information, but I highly recommend it. I have the juice solo and love it. This episode is also brought to you by Thrive Probiotic. That's just thrivehealth.com. Many of you have uh, loved the product. I'm so grateful that you're getting value out of it. Uh, not all probiotics are created equal. As many of you know, our immune system is centered in our gut. It's also where we produce serotonin, our feel-good chemical. And so I've been using Just Thrive Probiotic on a daily basis as well as their K2 and their new IgG uh, product and their prebiotic. And it's just been really, really uh, helpful. They have lots of clinical studies as well. And I think, you know, it's not just about a product, but it's really about the integrity and quality of the product. And I can say that uh, Thrive has a lot of integrity. So check them out, justthrivehealth.com. And if you put in peak at checkout, you'll get a nice discount. With that, it is my great pleasure to introduce the one and only Dr. Robert Augustus Masters. So I am here today with Robert Augustus Masters. Uh, Robert, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you. 
glad to be here. So I had the good fortune of working with uh, Roberts. Uh, it was now a couple of years ago at his home in Ashton, Oregon. I had been introduced to his work through my friend Connor Beaton uh, at Man Talks. And to say that the work with you was transformational would be an understatement. It was a sea change, and it marked for me a, a new chapter in life. And one of the th reasons I was so eager to speak with you um, on the show was I think that there is a, a yearning, I think, from both men and women for mm -hmm. men to step more fully into an individuated sense of self and their, for lack of a better term, uh, authentic and expressed masculinity. But given the times and the challenges of the times, I think many men are confused uh, around what that looks like. And you wrote uh, a book which I found to be a, a seminal read called To Be a Man, A Guide to True Masculine Power. And that I read that before we actually did some very, very deep uh, interpersonal work together. But I wanted to ask you, Robert, what's your sense of unlocking what it means to be a man today in the 21st century? It means, in, in a, to put it in a very brief form, turning toward what's painful, uncomfortable, distressing in our lives, even just a tiny bit at a time, but turning toward the things we normally would want to get away from, or distract ourselves from. And implicit in that is going to the roots of our wounding, not just trying to fix them at the surface, distract ourselves with, in various ways, but to actually turn toward what we've been running from our whole lives. And to do this without shaming ourselves. I take great pains in my work with men not to shame them for where they are. It's so important. Otherwise, there's a contraction, there's a pulling back, an unwillingness to say the things that are really difficult to say. So implicit in this, too, is, is courage, not just an ordinary everyday courage, but a deeper courage. And doing deep, deep work on oneself takes courage. It also develops courage. It deepens, like in your case, it deepens the courage. So we can take those dives you've been hesitating or procrastinating about for a long, long time, sometimes our whole life. Yeah. It's a hell of a leap. And when we take it, we're not done, but at least we have momentum in the direction of our authenticity. Mm -hmm. And when I see men doing this, there's always a certain joy, a sobering joy, because they're now on track more. They now are not trying to manipulate women for their own ends. They're also not losing their balls. In fact, their balls, guts, head, heart are all aligning, full-bloodedly aligning. And there's a joy in that, and you show up fully. And and it, it supports us in our work, relationship, our evolution, our relationship with our mortality. It's got many levels. There's spiritual dimensions, psychological, emotional. So I'm teaching men how to be emotionally literate, how to get in touch with their, their core wounding and the roots of that. Also open to who they truly are, but not in a dissociative spiritual bypassing way. So it's all working together. It's, in, it's integral. It's intuitive. Yeah, you, you actually blend that in a very remarkable way from my direct experience with you in terms of working with the physical, the psychological, the spiritual in, a, in, a, in an alchemy that really brings it forth. But I, I, what one word you t wrote a book about, actually, that I just want to touch on that I see as sort of a de epidemic in my community is this notion of spiritual bypassing, right? Uh -huh. that, that if we do, if we do, if we do this, uh, you know, we've kind of covered over it. We don't have to do the shadow work. We don't have to look at that deep wounding. We, we you know, we've done the, what, yes. whatever it is, if we, we can meditate our way or plant medicine or whatever, whatever it is, we can do the thing that yeah. is like the, the magic pill. Talk yeah, to me about what, what spiritual bypassing is and why it's, why, why, well, why it's so it prevalent. My book on it is 10 years old now. Yeah, and exactly. The, the thing I wrote about is still epidemic. Exactly. And I, I see it in almost every group I do. Even if someone knows it, they may know a little bit about it and be convinced they're not doing it. Yeah. In fact, any of us who have gone deep spiritually have done some spiritual bypassing. The avoiding of relational hassles, developmental tasks, unpleasant situations through spiritual practice and beliefs. It's as if we want to have a profound transformation of being without doing the work. <laughs> It's like instead of, climbing, instead of climbing Everest, a helicopter drops us to the top of Everest. Oh, now we've summited Everest. Yeah. It's like it's got that quality. And it's like I like to wake people up to, the, to what it is and then help them find out what they're trying to get away from through spiritual practice. Mm. For example, many people um, 
had a bad time with anger as a kid. It was often expressed aggressively. They learned to associate anger coming their way with a lack of love or danger. So then they find a spiritual path that also says anger is not a good thing. It's not wholesome. It's a bad thing. And they, they're they selected for that. They get into it, and they become anger phobic. And without anger, healthy anger on tap, we don't have good boundaries. We can't have good relationships, deal with conflict sanely. There's a long list of things. Dissociation is high. I often call spiritual bypassing dissociation in spiritual robes mm. in drag. I mean, there's a sense of, of if I do this, the promise is I'll get away from it all. And if I reach the big E, uh, so-called enlightenment, then I'm, I'm free and no more, no more pain, just bliss, ease, comfort. And that's a false awakening. Yes. It's usually followed by what I would call a very rude awakening. Yes. You get your ass kicked. And then yeah. was, you're down on your hands and your knees in the mud with the rest of us crawling. Just If, if your foundation is unhealthy, your life isn't going to work. And a healthy foundation has to include being grounded, being human, not cutting through our urge to escape the difficulties. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I'll, in, the, in the spirit of vulnerability, because I want this to be of greatest service, and I, I won't speak of any other men's work, but – to, to, to make it a bit personal, you know, I would say that I bypassed anger uh, and, and use spirituality uh, to do so for much of my life. I, I actually studied in a Buddhist country and um, sort of used meditation to repress. I, I felt like mm-hmm. anger wasn't really uh, something to be expressed. I have a deep reverence and love for my dad, but I've only I only literally saw him angry, I think, one time in my life. Um, and so I didn't have uh, a modeling, if you will, of, 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 of deep anger. But what was interesting is when we did our work together, I mean, I was just ready to pop. I don't know if you remember, but I, I was literally, it was a group setting and I was the You're first. You're on the mat. Okay. I, I, was, I was the first man in. Let's just put That's it like right. that. That's a great start to the group. Uh, we definitely, I definitely, uh, I definitely <laughs> led by going there, so to speak, if you will. Yeah. And, uh, but, but what was, what was powerful is in doing that work, I released re- deeply repressed anger that I had never expressed at a level in a safe container, obviously, but yeah. at a level at which it had, it had clearly been deep within me for a very long time, and I just it, it just had it had a place to pop. And can mm-hmm. you, so, so and, and for me, that's been a great service because I feel like it was like a compression balloon. And not to say that anger doesn't still come up, but yeah. I have a, a more a healthier relationship to it. Can you talk a little bit about anger and the role of anger in men's lives and how we can be in effective relationship with anger? As a well, fuel? one of the first things for men and women to understand is that anger and aggression aren't the same thing. Yeah. Aggression is, if I'm aggressive with you, what I mean by that is I'm, I'm on the attack. I, you, there's anger in it. I maybe turn red. I'm yelling at you. I'm pissed. But I don't give a shit about you. I'm just, I'm just after you to take you down. <clears throat> if I'm angry in a healthy way, I may look much the same, but my heart's involved to some degree. Mm-hmm. I'm not out to take you down. I'm out to cut through this whatever's between us, to cut through the relational deadwood. Yeah. And to do it in a way that's not too much for you, I'm also not going to be backed off like I'm in a, a Buddhist uh, meditation retreat where I'm not going to let any of it escape my lips. Yeah. I'm showing you my anger, and I'm vulnerable in it. I may be even close to tears. Somebody's anger brings on the tears. But I'm, I'm connected to you and I'm addressing something you've done that bothers me deeply. I'm underlining it emphatically, but I'm not hammering you with it. I'm not putting you down. We're connected. Yeah. That's so different than aggression. It's so different. And because I think it's once, expressed, it comes from a place of vulnerability. We see an epidemic of aggression, but that to me is dis, it's, it's disembodied. It's coming from a, a desire to hurt others. Whereas, it, 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 and, and correct me if I'm wrong, what I'm hearing in, in the listening of what you're sharing is an authentically expressed anger actually in some ways comes from a place of vulnerability and is in service to the other, even if it comes from a place of uh, an inner rage, as long as it's balanced with a sense of compassion. Uh, and and may, may, maybe that's not accurate, but can you can you share well, a little bit more that about that? Anger, that little of anger is compassion or wrath. Yeah. It's like heart, anger and love can coexist. Yes. That's the good news. Yeah. It takes a lot of work to access that, but if we practice, we'll find a little more caring. Next, next time you're angry at a, a friend, lover, fr- whatever, if you bring a little bit of heart to it, you'll notice the other person feels a little safer. Mm. If I'm aggressive with you, you're probably not going to feel safe. Most wouldn't. If I'm angry, you're probably going to feel much safer. Yes. Not because I'm toning it down or being a nice guy, but because I'm 
you can feel me in it. I haven't lost connection or caring for you. Yeah. And there's something to be said also for mindfully held anger, which is to me is the, uh, a conscious way of being with anger. That means where you don't express it, you let it circulate through your body. But I found many people are trying to do this, say, in a Buddhist sense, are actually not sitting with their anger. They're sitting on it. <laughs> you know? <Yes. clears throat> and there's yeah. often this receiving all that repressed. I mean, it's it's – to, to, to know our anger well is to know ourselves because anger is an emotion. An emotion isn't just a feeling you get out of your system. Emotions involves feeling, uh, cognition, social factors, all the imprints from your childhood. So it's not just in the body. It's not just a thing you can get out of your system. It's more complex. And anger is not just this primitive thing that doesn't belong in a civilized encounter. I think, it, I think it's present at every level of human development. If you were, If you or I were... Uh, right at the pinnacle of what it is to be fully human, our anger would be pretty clean all the time. Our heart would be involved all the time. We wouldn't be trying to get away from it. We wouldn't be teaching others to escape their anger or throwing maxims at them like one moment of anger can destroy eons of merit, etc. I've heard so much of that in spiritual circles. And the people who don't have t- t- their anger on tap are those whose boundaries are overly porous, weak, maybe non-existent. Mm-hmm. And if you and I don't have good boundaries, one of us is probably going to trash the other one in different ways. It's just inevitable. We have to have boundaries, healthy boundaries. Anger is the emotional guardian of the boundaries. So I, I, I think anger needs to be studied deeply. In the men's work I do, anger is a key topic along with shame, fear, sexuality. And anger is also a passion. Like if you're full of rage and you're expressing it in a, in a safe way – you're taken over. I've seen men and women in full rage suddenly shift to ecstasy in a mm. split second. Not that that's the goal, but there's so much vitality, so much fire pouring through their system. After a while, it's not p- finding someone to blame or poke, poke at. It's just pure energy, vitality, and suddenly there's joy. Yeah. Or you can be, or your lust level can go way up. Or you can cry harder. Maybe your grief kicks in and you cry, you sob your guts out. That's because you've embraced the passion. You're not indulging in it. Many people indulge in anger expression. They overdo it. And if someone complains, they'll say, what's what's your problem? You said to show my feelings. Here I am. But they're actually not expressing the feeling cleanly. So there's a responsibility on our part to express and express responsibly. That's beautiful. I, I, what, what comes up for me in listening was recognizing that there were, uh, there were two core sessions to my work with you. And only after expressing that deep anger, if you will, uh, did I uncover the deep grief and sadness. I did a lot of deep work around my dad and, and his, yeah. his dementia yeah. diagnosis. But the, the, the deep grief and sadness, which I had been sort of like keeping at bay because it was so existentially shifting, was, yeah. only, was only feasible to reach – uh, once I had moved through the anger around it, so it, it it was like it enabled me to excavate and and delve deeply into that core aspect of of yes of, of my beingness, and it's the thing I think that most of us numb against with our day to day, whether it be you know Netflix or in certain extreme cases with other individuals, whether it be alcohol or other forms of addictive mm-hmm. behavior. Yeah. It's like yeah. it's like you don't want to touch into that softness of your of, of your of, of your wound, of your heart, whatever that may yeah. be described. And I just remember working with you and it was interesting because you asked exactly the right questions, allowed the right space, but you also worked physically uh, and, and somatically in a way that just like to- it, it was like Again, I don't know the better word to use, but unlocking this deeply repressed um, sadness and grief, which only after on the other side of which did I actually feel, for lack of a better term, more fully myself and expressed. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like the anger or grief went away, uh, but it was like, again, like a pressure valve had been released and it allowed more space. It was kind of a – we can also look at it in the the framework of shadow work. There you are with a lot of your anger in your shadow, out of of touch with most of it, and your grief. Yes. They're both there. So once the anger flowed, then comes the grief. And the grief, of course, I'm getting – I'm helping you flow with it more by doing some body work. But it's not just to get, have a, for you to have a catharsis. It's to have, that you have release that's connected to the origins of your pain. Mm. Then it sinks in. You can make, Your life can shift because of that. If it was just simply pure catharsis, 
then that's not much more than emotional masturbation. We're just yes. blowing off steam. This was in context. It was catharsis in context. And you had a lot in you. Plus, you were ripe. Yeah. You made, you made my job easy. Once I got <laughs> pants on you, you were, you, know, you were just going for it. You weren't like wondering, well, what are the guys thinking of this? And no. All the snot and the tears and the sounds. It doesn't, didn't matter. doesn't matter. It's a bit like birth. Birth, chaotic, messy, a lot of fluids, crazy, unpredictable. Yeah. This is similar. Yeah. Because you're giving the way you're giving birth to yourself. Yes. And then you then you step out of that and you have a different perspective. And it's not just that you're high from the work, you're also grounded mm. and you're ready to change your life in ways that need changing. And you have the courage to do it. You know why? Because you're lined up. Mm. You're not going, part of me wants this, part of me wants that. There's no division. Yeah. There's no no dialogue backwards between left and right sides of the brain, for example. You're just lined up, you're whole. And being whole just feels really, really good. Even if things are shitty around us, it feels good to be embodied. You feel your feet in the ground, you're breathing, your emotions are there, you're transparent, you're vulnerable, and you're strong too. Yes. Yeah, that, al- that alignment of you talk about of, of sort of head, heart, uh, gut, balls, um, mm-hmm. it, it comes after that catharsis. I, I had the good fortune, which I, I think I shared with you, of when I was in my – sort of deepest shadow work of uh, a breakup with a, with a partner and went and, and was yeah. sort of a, a, a dark night of the soul, if you will. Yeah. That's actually when my father flew out and staffed my, I did a, a mankind project weekend and he was the mm-hmm. only father there out of 150 men. Mm-hmm. And he helped lead me through a process of individuation, if you will, a ritual rebirth, which I then integrated uh, meeting with these, this, this group of men for four years of my life, which was, which enabled the sea change. And what, what I see a lot is it, to your point, I feel like that let me be, be ready to just go there in that birthing process of like, I don't mind what this looks like. I don't care yeah, who's watching. Yeah. I'm just going to go there. But to your other point, to your point, I think the important part is also, I was also willing to do the work to integrate. And what I see yes. a lot in the, for lack of a term, personal development or spiritual communities is people chase the weekend. They chase the self-help book. They chase mm. the, 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 the seminar but or they chase the ecstatic experience, whether that be a transformational festival, etc. But they don't necessarily commit to doing the integration of like how – Yes. You, yeah, it's yes. one thing to, to be in the ecstasy and to feel that alignment is amazing. But to maintain – to do the work to maintain it and deepen is, is something I often see – Lacking mm-hmm. is that? Me too. Is that's that very it, common? It's Super very common, common, right? How do you? Because how does one integrate? initial stuff? Initial stuff is more like here's the honeymoon with deep open. <laughs> exactly. People get they get it, and I see quite a low percentage of people actually stay with it. Yes. And if the ones those who stay with it and work do the hard work of integration, which is not glamorous work, there's no, no one ch- cheering you on. It's more like it's and it's because daily and plus there's a lot of slips. You may have worked with reactivity for a long time, for example, and you still get reactive and reactive and reactive, or you're in a critics on your case. There's a lot of signs that you're not progressing, but if you stay with it, yeah. magic can happen in the sense that the shift that happens is stays with you. Yes. But that requires work away from the therapeutic encounter once a week or a group. It requires uh, a commitment and a discipline. That's a big thing, yes. I think, for men to take on the discipline of turning toward their pain. Uh, Working with their sexuality in the same way, taking becoming more emotionally literate, those are things that are worth practicing. Not just so you have better time in life, better work, better relationships. Also prepares you for your death too, because you're more you get to be whole for quite a while. Mm. And when you're off, when you get off track, you don't put up with that for very long. You name it, you don't shame yourself for it. You get on back on track. You change your breathing, do a workout, um, have a conscious rant go to another piece of work, whatever. Yes. But you do something about it. You don't just sort of ride the high of the group you did a few months before. You stay with it. And then if you come back, like I see guys that come back to work with me the second or third time, they go much deeper mm-hmm. and it's more solid in them. Or if I train people or do mentorships, there's even more of that. That, that continuity is crucial. It's like with awareness. You can do a meditation retreat and get really clear in a couple of weeks if is sitting there. But if you do it, if you do something every day to keep yourself mindful, not just in the meditation hour or half hour, but throughout the day, mm. whatever you're doing, you're on the toilet, you're falling asleep, you're driving down the freeway, there's that sense of being mindful but not pressuring yourself to be mindful. Yeah. 
You know that this implies it's like there's a sense where we reach a point where we can't go back, which is a lovely point. You can't go back and be a caterpillar and munch on the whatever, <laughs> and, and you and you you're maybe not come far enough to fly fully, but you know you're in process. You're in the chrysalis. You're starting to leave the cocoon, mm. and there's such joy in that because there's a sense of of you cannot go back. You may now and then go back a little bit, but you're you've actually broken through to a different level of your being. I love that. I'm actually, you mentioned death, and I have uh, in my hand, actually, as we speak, uh, as we uh, are talking, a, a coin that says Memento Mori, and it was given to me by Ryan Holiday, um, and it's a Stoic creed, which basically keeps keep death in mind as an impetus for living, right? And, and, and it reminds me a lot of the Native American sentiment of today is a good day to die, mm-hmm. which, which to me goes to not a, a calling forth of death, but more of the 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 value of, of standing in in the unis of you in each day, for lack of a better term, but I think, and w- w- what comes up for me is when I think about the Stoics, or I think about, for example, in the particular case I just mentioned, Native Americans, a lot of traditional cultures had what I would, you know what I would call processes of individuation, right? They mm-hmm. had ways yeah. in which. Boys were individuated into manhood, into masculinity, yes. and they were yeah. held by their elders and guided. And when they, when an elder would see an unindividuated man, perhaps a boy by the river starting to flirt sexually with a young woman, but may not know the consequence of his actions, uh, you know, if if he were to proceed forward, then mm-hmm. he would be led through a trial, which would which would kind of call forward that masculinity. And today we don't have that in, in, in modern life. Yeah, and I yeah. feel like that's led to what, what we even see it at, in very large levels of leadership uh, in, in this country and around the world. In my view, an unexpressed aspect of unindividual or an expressed aspect of unindividuated masculinity, that, that sort of armchair tyrant. That, yeah, there's no, there's no real initiation. Exactly. Like initiation. So a lot of um, our leaders are, stuck in their adolescence yes yes with the a- adult rationality doing the speaking and talking but there's an immaturity and there's a lot of shame that's not exposed and there's a sense of, of if you do any personal work and you make it go public with it you're going to be shamed people are going to look at you upon like you're lesser right. you went for counseling you went for psychotherapy what's wrong be a man what's wrong with you <laughs> man up yes yeah. and i've seen guys in the work with guys in the military who've told me the, the scariest thing in their lives wasn't so much what happened in their military encounters that was scary but it was having to get transparent and vulnerable in deep work wow show themselves and un- reveal themselves that was more scary for them than the other it's interesting you bring up the military because what I've also heard is part of the post-traumatic stress that occurs, yes, of course, is, is some of the horrific aspects of combat, uh, but also is the lack of – to this also this process of individuation, which happened oftentimes in tribal culture, right? So where mm-hmm. where, pe- where men were held in a brotherhood, if you will mm-hmm. – um, in military is one of the few experiences where you confront your mortality as would be traditional in a rite of passage and you do it with a brotherhood. So what I've, mm-hmm. what I've been told um, is in combat, what often leads to the sense of trauma coming back is not just the combat, ex- you know, the combat experiences yeah, that we're faced, yeah. but it's the lack of that brotherhood, that lack of yeah. that sense of purpose of standing for something bigger than yourself, of being willing mm-hmm. to die uh, for something greater even if that's yeah. just having your your brother's back you know even yeah. if you don't believe yeah. in the cause but you know that like and then how do you go back and work at walmart once you've you know been in the trenches with a brother facing life and death and so how do we in a, the absence of these processes of individuation uh, how do we with contemporary culture in your mind uh, create that individuated masculine by making it more available yeah Making sure it's quality. It's yep. the, the people leading it actually know what they're doing. Yep. And also, like, a, and when I do, no matter how deep a group goes, I know I, I'm doing my part. I'm very skilled at it, but I also can see it feel the group energy that's created. It's like a small community for those mm-hmm. five days or a week. That cr- adds more support, more safety. Mm-hmm. So, like, when I worked with you and that, there was a bunch of other men observing or maybe helping me out a little bit with the body work they're in there and they're all moved they're affected by what you're doing so it is a, it is a naturally occurring organic brotherhood yeah same with the women's groups the very same dynamic happens and and that creates an even safer container mm. to do it there's a sense we're not alone in this i got that going too we're all suffering 
we all have slipped badly at different times. Some of us have had horrendous starts to life. Here we are. We're creating a, a sanctuary here together that also serves as a crucible for the work that needs to happen. Mm. What a dynamic combo. It's crucible and sanctuary at the same time. Oh, well said. Yeah, it. that was my direct experience uh, of the work. One of the things that called me forth, I actually want to read a passage, a short passage from your book, because sure. for me it was, it was a large catalyst. But I think for those listening, you know, there's both the women who deeply yearn for a man who's, who's done the work, for lack of a better term, mm-hmm. and has stepped into confronting that shadow. But I think for a lot of men also, uh, there's, a, there's a calling that's latent within, but they may not necessarily know where, where to go. Mm-hmm. And this, to me, speaks to that, that sort of calling. And, and you write, do you want to see uh, what you don't see about yourself? Do you want to discover and face what you've been keeping in the shadows? Do you want to wake up? to who and what you truly are without bypassing your raw humanity? Do you want to find a deep alignment of heart, guts, and intellect? Are you looking, however reluctantly, for what calls forth the full you? Are you losing interest in settling for less? To me, that was such a powerful invocation when I was deciding Mm -hmm. whether or not to do the work, quote unquote, uh, because... It so speaks to, I think, the feeling that so many men feel, which is that there's more. Whatever that is, there's yeah. a moreness within all of us and a deep yearning to tap into that more. And part uh, of the work here is to, is to be more, cultivate more intimacy with that longing. Yes. That aching. It's yes. there. It's there in every one of us. And, but what we don't all share in common is, this, is, is aligning ourselves with that longing. Not looking for instant fulfillment, but letting that longing, our relationship to that longing, guide us. And it will pull us in unusual directions. It will take it, it'll make us risk more than we normally would. It takes us to our edge, our growing edge. And the thing about our edge is that if it's easy, it ain't your edge. If it doesn't scare you, it's not your edge. If it doesn't ask for the very best from you, it's not your edge. And, and, there's that sense of – I think it invites forth the warrior in a man when he senses this is his edge yeah. and he has a chance to, to work with it, to go toward the dragon. There's the cave, the treasure, the whole metaphor. Here's, here it is going toward it. Yeah. And as closer you get to it, the more clearly you can see it. And if you didn't have that confrontation with the dragon, you wouldn't know what to do with the treasure. Yes. You'd, you'd squander it. You'd waste it. You wouldn't have the, the in, in ter- integrity and wisdom to make good use of it because you wouldn't have confronted something as difficult as your personal dragons. Yes. And this is all to do with shadow. I mean, my latest book is called Bringing Your Shadow Out of the Dark. Mm. And it's a really deep, I don't know if you've seen it, it's a really deep look at shadow in every way I can possibly think of. And if we don't know our shadow, and I don't see shadow in the Jungian sense, I see shadow as the container for our unresolved, unfaced conditioning. Mm. It's a big thing. If we don't know our shadow and work with it, to me, we're, we cannot step into what we need to step into to make this world a better place. We can. Even if we have the best of intentions, our unresolved shadow stuff will skew what we do. It's so, I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up because it's something I've been really thinking about. You know, My work previously was with Global Citizen, which was changing mm-hmm. the world sort of outside and, and working to be of service to those living in extreme poverty through, through celebrating our shared humanity. Yeah. And but when my dad g- g- got ill, I, and I mentioned to you, I made a transition. And I, and I, what I, the reckoning that I had was I am passionate and committed to being a stand for work in the world. But what I realized is, to me, ultimately, the world is a manifestation of our collective internal state. And mm-hmm. if you look, to use a, perhaps a crass analogy, but you look at a, a lottery winner or a pro athlete, 80 to 90 percent go not only back to their default after the windfall of, 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 of wealth, the, 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 the mm-hmm. treasure as you describe it, yeah. uh, but they actually many of them go bankrupt because they haven't yet done the deep inner work or established a mindset to be able to hold that windfall of, um, of material means, so to speak. So my, think, my view is that ultimately there's a sort of a commensurate birthing of consciousness that mm-hmm. needs to happen for us to actually change the world outside of us. It has to come from within, which to me, at the moment, speaks at its core to shadow. So tell me a little bit more about you know, how you see shadow and you see our, our both individual and collective work with shadow. I see it as something that's absolutely needed at these times. Yeah. And it, it, I, I see very – it actually hasn't taken a hold yet, mm. but it needs to. That's yeah. why I wrote the book. 
and I've even started I started a new nonprofit that's because um, I know I have to do that. That's going to have two main things. It's focused on one is educating and training people in what I would call core level shadow work, mm. which is what I'm doing all the time in my work. What I did with you is that. Yes. And two, having this go mainstream. Maybe well, maybe it won't happen before I die, but I still want to put energy into that because I know without that, we're being run from behind the scenes. We're on automatic. And, and we don't have to be. If we get curious about it, what's in our shadow, what we've had to put there to survive our childhoods or adolescence, what's in there? And everyone has a shadow, but not everyone is, is, knows their shadow, is intimate with it. There's so much in there. The stuff that's awful, mm. places you or me where they're like, we're kind of like, oh, what's that doing? Place me where I don't have any compassion, just want to use people or I'm violent. There's also our bigness and beauty is often in the shadow. Mm. People often will... Be taught to tone it down, don't show up too much, keep quiet, so their bigness and beauty and their greater qualities get pushed in the shadow, especially true of women in our culture. Mm. And when that comes forward, you don't see arrogance, look how great I am. It's more like, oh, I get to shine. Yeah. I don't have to shut down my light because it makes another person feel not big enough with me. Yes. And there's a challenge in that too. Mm. The bigger you are, the brighter you are, I can either be intimidated by it or I can I can get off on it and, and have it inspire my own true size, my own best qualities. Mm. And the work I see it as, in a core sense is to become intimate with all that we are, everything, mm. everything. And I see that collectively too. And what we haven't done transitioned yet is from this working on ourselves to where there's a sense of we, more we, not to obscure the I, the individual, but to, so it works together. Because yeah. we, we are in the realm of time now of, of collective, a lot of collective fear, understandably so, collective overwhelm, collective shadow, collective PTSD. I think our species has PTSD. Yes. Look, at our, look at human history back the last thousands of years. Not an easy ride. No. A lot of hell. And a lot of things, perks we have now, they did not have then at all. And we, we may still suffer now, but we have that in our history. It's in our genes. It's there. And it's workable. The good news is this is all workable. We can know our shadow more. We can grow up as men. We can we can leave our adolescence behind, mm. and we can become safer for women. Mm. And women can evolve in this too, finding their voice more, being more direct, taking their power back. And so we're doing it together. That's what I want to see happen. Is there's more a sense of doing it together. For example, take grief. We've all had grief. We all have grief. But there's personal grief. Then there's our grief. Then there's the grief. Mm. And that grief is everyone's, where we start to feel the grief of the entire species, the entire planet. And we don't think it, we feel it. Not not forever, not all the time, it would, be, it would be too much for us, but we actually open ourselves to feeling what's going on. And that makes it, it connects us. Yeah. I mean, a famous rabbi once said, when he was asked, what would, what do you think would we could do about the conflict in the Middle East, Israel and Palestinians, etc.? He said that you have to; they have to grieve together. Mm. It may never happen, but that's the thing. I agree with him. We have to grieve together. Then we can feel our losses, not just your loss, my loss, but our losses. Yeah. So that's part of the men's work I do too. I work with grief more and more because it connects all of us. It, it it does. It's one of the truest things, you know. It's one of the truest things all of us experience. And uh, it, it's interesting. I, I just rewatched Invictus, uh, uh, which was you know about Mandela utilizing rugby, um, and instead of what everyone called him to do, which was to sort of change the colors of South Africa, right. to right. instead um, take the bold and courageous move, which was to to exalt, if you will, the oppressor. So as to so as to tap into their to their shared humanity. Now that doesn't necessarily speak to the shared grief, but I think um, what they did was the Truth and Reconciliation Committee, right? So they recognized that a, a new nation couldn't be built without actually confronting uh, and people having the space to speak about the mm -hmm. shad the shadow which had run rampant. And I think what you're speaking to resonates because I feel like uh, we we need a collective truth and reconciliation to the deep and, traumas that all of us have, exactly. have confronted. Imagine if America looked at its own shadow. Wow. America has this – Slavery. It's, 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 it's the not so beautiful. No. I mean the land of the free is not really the land of the free. Never Genocide of Native yeah, Americans. Yeah, and, and the – exactly, exactly. There's a huge – and there's a lot of shame in that. 
It yeah. was supposed to be incredible shame of what was done to Native Americans. All the treaties, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of treaties broken, not honored. The list goes on and on and on. And it's compensated for by this belief many people have that we're the greatest nation on the planet. We're the greatest. That can cover up so much. So America has a shadow. Mm-hmm. And but facing that shadow won't be won't happen effectively until more and more people realize they all have a shadow facing it makes them more whole the benefits are incredible Mm. but it requires work it's not just a glamorous get high weekend it's something that is not taught just like in schools emotional literacy is still not taught totally and let alone shadow work let alone knowing our our uh, spiritual anatomy etc yeah the the i mean well our our, the prevailing education system is still built on sort of uh, 20th century industrial capitalism. So it's, it's kind of training yeah. up people to be a cog in the wheel, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and we need, I think, a new education system for 21st century living, which is part of my, my vision for this podcast is just to highlight, you know, to me, those who I've had beautiful experience with, like yourself, uh, and share, share access points, doors that people can walk through if they want to take that work. Mm-hmm. Um, but my question is for those who may be in a place you know, because I'm always trying to be mindful of a listener who may not have financial means, or may not, or and may not be in a in a place where they're, uh, you know, have access to a lot of these great teachings. You know, I was, for example, uh, with a woman who was in Turkey, and she was just talking about relishing in an online platform because she didn't have access to the kinds of teachers that we uh-huh. do, for example, in Los Angeles or yeah. or other aspects. Yeah. For those who are who want to uh, start to approach, if you will, the the work of the shadow. Obviously, your upcoming book would be an amazing place to, to, to start delving into that. But are there other resources, whether that be trainings and or or thoughts that you may have around how people can start to uh, start to do in a safe container work around, work around the shadow? Well, what I what I can offer that's that does least financially challenging is I have a, a program done with Sounds True called Knowing Your Shadow mm. five and a half hours and I also my new book has been out for a year oh great so I have to out, read that yeah it's out and it's, it's, it's available and um, and also one of my senior teachers and um, in our in my, in my center and I put together an online program on shadow work is halfway through right now it's got a couple hundred people on it right now signed up, and they're taking it. They're taking it. It's very successful. That's a, a cheaper one. We've also offered. We gave it to some at a discount. We also gave some freebies. So we're, I, I want to. Ideally, I like to have, make everyone have everyone have access to what I'm doing. Yes, that's why the nonprofit will hopefully provide scholarships for those who can't afford the training. Because I want to train people on this way of working more. I love it. And some people can afford it. Other people can't. Some of the ones who can't would be incredibly gifted at doing this. So I want to make this available to them. I love how you put it. Early. First of all, thank you for that. Uh, and uh, I'll link below to, to your work uh, in the show notes. But I, but I want to also acknowledge you said something earlier that just struck me as you were talking now, mm-hmm. which is that I may not be around for it. Um, and one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot is this notion of legacy. And what is it that we are living forward in the future? Like how is our life um, – you know, you know, I actually just launched a campaign called Legacy, which is, I hope to be a, a combination of this uh, in, the inner work and, and the work in the yeah, world, yeah. specifically around climate, but uh, but bringing our inner work at, into consequence as we see flourishing for the world around us. And, yeah. and, and that, that notion of legacy is something I've been thinking a lot about because I think, you know, and part of this goes to, and, and not to make in any way, uh, you know, someone's pursuit of their dreams and being well uh, compensated for it uh, in any way an issue. But I think oftentimes in society, we, we vault, we, we vault the billionaire who has amassed a billion in wealth, but we may not necessarily know the consequence or the shadow of how they got there. And, and, Mm -hmm. and, and we don't exalt necessarily those who may, you know, who maybe have a vision towards, uh, you know, uh, impacting hopefully lives on the way to a billion, a billion lives, you know, like mm-hmm. it'd be cool if we exalted people based on the, the merit and the legacy of the consequence of their work as it relates to the impact of other people. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's powerful that you mentioned that your work is really, a, you're, you're sow- sowing seeds now for the life that will be lived beyond you in terms yes. of how yes. this work grows. How we do you how think about ha- you legacy? Know, how, this is how this happened. I was yeah. already into this 10 years ago. Yeah. But not but not fully into it. Mm. About three years ago, I almost died. I had I don't know if you heard I had a had a heart attack. 
I, it came on so strong. I literally, I had five minutes to live. And I was blacking out with the agony, the pain. Diane, my wife, shoved some baby aspirin in my mouth, and she called 911. An ambulance was there within five minutes. Mm. And I was gone. I was a goner. This was not like uh, something to last an hour. I had five minutes. They worked on me instantly inside in the back of the ambulance, got me to the emergency uh, med for 20, uh, 20 miles away. An hour after I had the heart attack, I had a stent put in. My artery was cleared, and I was in bliss. I was in great pain, but I was so effing happy to be <laughs> alive. And yeah. after, after that, Michael, every day was bonus for me. I mean it. It wasn't just an idea. And I, my meditations on my own mortality and death and impermanence deepened. I do them every day, and I... I I feel much more intimate with my own passing, my death. I understand death more, even though it's a great mystery at the same time. And I have a sense, every time I walk in a group, I do like 15, 16 of them every year, I I say to myself, this this, this definitely could be my last time. Yeah. So, I, so I love giving my all to it. And then the little community dissolves after five days. And another week or two passes to another group. I love doing that. Yeah. Because that's what I'm best at. A big group I could do. I used to do big ones, but eight guys, eight women, eight men and women in a room, maybe 10. That's my max. I keep an eye on everyone. And that's the legacy. I can spread this, train people in it, and the scale is small, but it works. Plus the books. I feel like I'm done with my books, basically. I've done five of them since spiritual bypassing. And it's kind of exhausting doing a book and publishing, editing, the whole thing. Yeah. And I'm almost 72, and I want to save my juice for the work I'm doing. Yes. But here's the bonus. I mean, and, and it also, I got more. I got super fit, lost weight. Yeah, you're looking good. I, I didn't even acknowledge that when you jumped on the call, but I was like, you're I, I, a little different there. I but. the gym every day, and I, <laughs> I, I, I like it. And uh, Diane and I have more time. I mean, the, the, the heart attack, the doctor said they, they called that the big one. Wow. That's the one that just kills you like that. Just, I could not. I could not get any air into my, my left lung, and I was trying not to black out. That was the key thing, not to black out. And this poor day, I'm watching me dying right in front of her, wow. and we're at the mercy of an ambulance coming. But we could have been out hiking. I would have died for sure on the trail mm. or driving down the freeway, something. So I got – and I've, it's, it's my ninth or tenth time being very close to death. So I'm, I'm going to start doing groups. I'm going to call them uh, elderhood in the making. For people 55 and up or 60 and up, Love where we do that. the same work as you witness with me, but we all, it also has more focus on aging. The fact that, you know, these bodies are slowly break down. So I'm super fit, but I don't have the resources I have when I was in my 20s or 30s or 40s. And I don't mind. Yeah. I like the seasoning. Yeah. I like the opening. And, and I, I feel good about death. I feel dying into life, dying into a deeper life. Embracing the mystery of it, and um, not trying to prolong things. I have enough time. The time I have is enough. I know that. Yeah. So that that stirs me. But I, I also came close to death when I was younger. But I didn't. When I rebounded, I, I kind of went right back into my life more. I didn't um, stay with it. I meditated on it a little bit, but I was so gung ho. I was more of an experience junkie, gathering experiences. No, I'm not. I mean, I'm content just to be home here. People show up to work with me, write, write things, take the odd break, work in Hawaii a little bit. I'm enjoying my aging. Like, my 70s is my favorite decade so far. <laughs> I love – I'm actually tearing up a bit because um, it's just so beautiful to hear. You know, I think our culture doesn't uh, exalt – uh, the elder in a way that I saw, for example, when I lived in Sri Lanka and I live with, with the grand, I live with my grandparents, my Tata, mm -hmm. my host father was in his seventies and there was such wisdom and it was, it was actually venerated. So in that culture, mm -hmm. the grand, my Nangis, my little sisters would actually, uh, uh pray down and worship as a, a sign of respect, mm. their elder, their grandparents, uh, before they left the house every morning and, and at night before bed. And yeah. I think that the, you know, and that was actually, again, speaking from a place of vulnerability, you know, the deep work, uh, which I have not talked about in any way publicly, but around saying, like, spiritually being open to say goodbye to my father, who I love with all my heart. Yeah. Uh, but but embracing the grief of knowing, you know, his his time is, is limited, uh, mm -hmm. given his disease, was the deep work that we did together. And it was so profound to yeah. to actually 
acknowledge, which I, against tooth and nail, I mean, for the two, three years prior, I was thinking of every doctor, every diet, mm-hmm. everything I could do to fix him from dying. and To keep him from dying. Correct, yeah. correct. And it wasn't until, I mean, it, I think our work actually was was when I finally reckoned, held by this group of eight men, with the deep, deep grief of my father, who has been nothing but, you know, who's had my back in a way very few other people have, and whom I have a profound love for, for his passing, you know? And and, and yeah. it was, uh, that to me was a a reckoning, because I was yeah. afraid to face that. It, it was my dragon in certain regards. Uh, yeah. I mean, there are other dragons for sure, uh, but that was... That was a dragon in terms of that facing that mortality. But since then, it's been an impetus for living. I mean, like I mm-hmm. mentioned to you before we jumped on, you know, this podcast I started recording five years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, I think I talked to you about wanting to do one when we did work together. But at that time, I what my I hadn't confronted my own shadow, and I and my ego got in my way. And it's mm-hmm. been such a, a a gift. And literally, I sit here as you talk. <laughs> I always look at this coin of, you know, tom- Isn't that great? tomorrow is not promised. And it was actually going and seeing Fleetwood Mac and seeing a tribute to Tom Petty, who I'd always wanted to see, but who had yeah. died. And I said yeah. to myself, I could die tomorrow. Tomorrow's never promised. I don't want to die with my gift in me. And and that, that impetus of using death as an impetus for living has been profound. Which So it, for those who are, who are listening, because I don't think many people talk about a healthy expression of, of death and consideration of death. How 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 do you think that people can start to think about mortality, or what are the ways in which death can help people delve into some of the key tenets you talk about as it you relates know, one to of the, first, the first things I think that to, before we get to that is yeah, just to really look at this means to 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 take a deeper look at impermanence. Mm. The fact that impermanence is is the one thing we can count on is permanent. Mm. And and we most of us know that intellectually, but you really feel that somebody to look upon sacred things in your life has already gone. Mm. Not that you want them to be gone, but you can sense their extremely temporary arising here. It's like yeah. our lifetime. You can see our lifetime. Here's birth and death, and there's this brief spark of blast of color and drama in between. We call our life. Mm. It goes by so fast. It's like a dream. It goes by so fast, and it's so much is packed into it. And we do, when we have that perspective, we don't we get into our life even more, mm. more deeply, and then we don't let because the avoiding death deadens us. That's the thing; it deadens us, and facing it, and not having a, a preset idea about like I don't have a preset idea about I want to go into it with an open, clear mind, open heart, surrendered body, opening to the mystery, mm. rather than going okay, I'm expecting to see Jesus or a, a, a certain Tibetan. But uh, it, I don't have that. I used to to some degree. It's just mystery. And I like the fact that this is a great mystery. Mm. Infinite mystery is not threatening to me. In fact, I feel at home in it. Wow. It, just at home in it. And I open to the mystery. That would be my thing. I open to the mystery. And I don't ever sense, okay, now I've got to the bottom and now I've got to figure it out. Because <laughs> the part of me that wants to figure it out is part of the mystery. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, 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 here we are. And we, yeah. with all our knowledge, and, and we actually are facing something we cannot solve. And in that sense, we let explanation become secondary to revelation. Revelation is more like you open to it, and you feel it, and you still live your life. You still are functional. You can think. You can make shopping lists. But you have a bigger perspective. Mm. And that's what I cultivate when I'm working in my work now. So I'm leading, but I'm being led by what I pick up from everyone moment to moment my radar is on high alert and that's lovely i'm i'm playing leader but i'm also i'm being led and it's all like one healing sanctuary slash crucible yeah i love that i'm grateful i get to do that yeah your your way of being in that way was a great uh demonstrator i i love i love how you put that that embracing of the great mystery and i think my experience of you, which I think was is an impetus for living for me as well, is you owned I, – I don't think I've ever reflected this to you, but one of the things I loved was when you were present to the work. In other words, when you stepped what I would say on the field or on the mm-hmm. mat, however you want to put it, you were fully present. Like you weren't – there was no distraction. You were 100% present and holding the container for all the men to do what mm-hmm. they needed to do. And mm-hmm. you as a vessel would go wherever you needed to go to facilitate them. 
yeah. in, in, with, with strength and guidance, but also softness and being in the listening yeah. that, for that work to eventuate. But what I also uh, noticed is when that work was done, you went on and did your own thing. Like you, it, there wasn't like a, there wasn't a, uh, a hanging in the middle ground of like, they sort of like, it, it was, it was kind of this beautiful thing of here's someone. And like, there were probably times where like, I would have deep questions and I would just want to probably chat your ear off. And it wasn't like you, like, as soon as it, the work was done, you like went in the basement or anything like that. But it was like for you, in my experience of you, it was like, here's my boundary. When I'm in, I'm 110% in. And then when we're done, we're done. And I, mm-hmm. and until, until next time. And yeah. to me, as someone who hasn't always effectively owned my own boundaries, that was actually a beautiful, a beautiful catalyst for thinking about. And it's okay. also of, ser- of service to the group because exactly. when I, when I would, I would take a break between morning and afternoon sessions, you know, where I went, I'd go, I'd, I'd go into my bedroom, I'd fall asleep for a couple hours, then come back out refreshed. Yes. I have to, even though the work looks effortless, I have to rest after it. Yeah. As I get older, I'm I'm enjoying naps more and more. I highly recommend them. <laughs> <laughs> I love I love that. Yeah. So uh, there's, there's that sense of t- if I take care of myself, I'm more available. Yes. And if I if I stand around and I, I and I don't if I do something that doesn't align not aligned with that, I'll come in a little more cloudy when I come in. My commitment is to come into that group fresh, present, um, not carrying anything. I'm yes. just open. And, and that's a delight, a delight to have to do that. It's like I have to do it, but it's not, it's not like a typical have to. There's no pressure. Yeah. Yeah. It's so beautiful. thanks for that. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, 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 I noticed it because I think it, it blends. Like you said, boundaries in a way are an integral part of, of both healing and effective, I think, individuation. And, yeah. you know, to your point earlier, you know, one of the messages I got when I was, you know, I'm six foot four and I had always gotten a message of, you know, Michael, you don't know your own strength. Like you need to, you know, it was just, it was, wasn't meant to in any way be, um, diminishing, but I, yeah. I got that message of like, you know, a little bit play small, like, you know, hold yourself in a contained mm-hmm. way. And what's what was beautiful is in your work, both in the expression of anger and the expression of sadness, it was an, it was an allowing of that, aspect which i think all of us have of of certain aspects we've repressed in ourselves and so well, the boundaries were in a helpful context of saying yeah. okay there's times where you can totally let loose and then there's times where also you get to nurture that because i see a lot yeah. of times also in deep work people go from this deep exalted state to then like having casual chit chat or banter and i'm like mm-hmm. actually no i'm owning my boundary i just i just mm-hmm. like had a, an exalted experience i'm gonna go journal in the woods and be in my own mm-hmm. space you know or whatever mm-hmm. i need to do yeah yeah Exactly. And in terms of legacy, this t- ties in with this a little bit for me. I was hearing you speak just now, is about we each have our own unique gifts. Mm. I think when we, our life is really working for us, we recognize our gifts and we're bringing them forward. Mm. Not to exalt our ego. We just do it because it's part of being fully human. It feels natural. If you're really good at something, it's a service to others. Bring it forward. Develop it. Get support for it. Labor in private or be on a big stage. doesn't matter. Yeah. It's a gift. And the invitation to wake up is also a gift. It's always there. And to go deeper and to not settle. Don't settle. Don't settle. What? Speaking of don't settling, another thing I want to acknowledge you for that I loved is your relationship with your, your wife. And I have yet to call in my queen, so to speak. Um, but what? how do you see the process? Because, you know, to, 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 in this context of masculinity – I loved the dance that you two exemplified. Um, how, what was for you the aspect of how do you see people calling in their partner? I think there's just a lot of men and women. I don't know the most articulate way to put it. but Well, lo- having a longing for that, yeah. which you had, I had before we met. Mm. Having that longing and also not settling in terms of, of having your list of what the qualities you want and making sure, double sure, triple sure that the other person – has, is working on themselves, has worked on themselves, knows themselves. Can you hear me now? It looks like you just froze. Yeah, there, I, I, I think that's a, it's a glitch in our in our system, oh, but I can our, still hear you. The audio is still good. Okay. Yeah, the audio is still great. You, you, your eyes are rolled up like you're going into a nervicalpo samadhi state. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's not happening. No, no, no. It's not happening presently. And also with, no. with Diane, I thought of her right before you mentioned that because she – one of her messages to women, she comes into the women's groups I do, don't 
settle. And just to explain that, don't settle. Don't go for an almost. Don't settle. Mm. Implied in that is it's better to be on your own. If you settle, then you're going to always be falling short. You're going to be dissatisfied. The other person is going to be under pressure to shift. It doesn't work. And many of us are with partners where it's not working that well because we didn't pick our partners. Our conditioning did the picking. And once we wake up to that, it's very humbling. Oh my God! It wasn't. I didn't choose this wonderful person. My conditioning didn't. Oh, now he or she's not so wonderful. Yeah. Gee, they're, they're, they, they they seem so familiar because they are. They they mirror your childhood wounding, the charges you developed then. And when I met Diane, one of the key things for me right from the very first minute when she called me from Ojai, California, I was in Vancouver, British Columbia, to ask if she could set one of my poems to music was the profound ease I felt with her. Uh, and that's, that has continued the whole time. No great sparks. Our chemistry came about not from the, in the usual way. It came about because of our connection. Mm. The aphrodisiac was our connection and mm. our love and our total safety with each other, total transparency. And it continues. We're going to our last chapter. I'm 72 almost. She's 68. We're just so grateful to have this with each other to journey into our elderhood, all the creaks in the, in the body shifting and and more opening to the mystery. Yeah. She has a chant at one of her um, uh, CDs. The final chant is called "I Open to the Mystery." Mm. It's like a it's like a uh, an East Indian chant, but it's all in English. Wow. I open to the mystery. I open to the mystery, and I know I will be shown. Not knowledge in the knowledge sense, but I will be shown as you open. Magic happens. So I, I have her, and she doesn't do the groups with me anymore because she's of health conditions, but I have her presence, her love behind me, supporting me. So I still do my work if she was gone, but it would not have the same. It would be missing something significant, highly significant. Thank you for sharing that. Um, it's so beautiful to see. I, I mean, just witnessing, it, you know, it was like it was so beautiful to see you together and to see a, a partnership that at least to me read as so uh, powerful and true. And, and, and also as I think about it, I think about that, right? It's like a lot of times, as you said, people, people relate based on their conditioning and oftentimes their list is very much about the surface, but how someone mm-hmm. looks and this, or, or, you know, surface levels, mm-hmm. it's based on how society yeah. will perceive X, Y, Z. And it's like, you know, my parents, uh, you know, have been married now, it will be 50 years in April and my mother's, you know, now my principal, the principal caregiver for my dad, which I would not wish on anyone. But what I think it is, is a testament to their love mm-hmm. that, you know, she, she says, you know, we, he gave me the best life I can imagine. I'm sure they did for each other. Yeah. And it's my time to look after him. But I think that degree of thinking long term about who will have your back, for lack of a better term, who will you have great joy mm-hmm. with, who will you want to dance yes. with through those creeks. Yes. Um, in the long term, when, when when we're in those different chapters of life, is something that I've become more aware of, and it's 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 so powerful to see folks like yourself. I think exemplify and living. And that. It, it, take, it takes more than love. It takes a, a a compatibility. Yes. It takes a vulnerability. It takes a, tra- a mutual transparency. Yes. And it takes being emotionally literate. Yes. Diane and I are both very fiery people, so we have anger, but we learn, we're, it's very quick. It's how, how do you how do you pro, how do you move through it with each other? Well, I guess you you've, you've established by, by being direct yeah. and being vulnerable, yeah, and and not losing connection. Yeah. So it often can turn into laughter soon, or it passes another way. It doesn't linger and linger and linger. Wow! And there's a freedom in that. Totally, she gets to be fully herself. I get to be fully myself. Plus, there's nothing I can hide from her, which I didn't like in the beginning that much all the time. <laughs> she's extremely intuitive and can see, but now it's a delight. Yes. We both see each other clearly, and there's that ease, that comfort. The seeing each other clearly, you talk a bit in your work about shame, and I feel like shame is often associated with that which we hide from other people. It's the yeah. part of ourselves. It's the secret or the dark, you know, the darkness or whatever. You know, it's the unexpressed shadow that we don't want people to see. Yeah. And, I, and I imagine that, you know, Bre- Brene Brown talks about it. You've talked, you talk about it. Um, that having a partner where you, there's nothing to hide from actually, in a way, then is an antidote to shame. I would and imagine, you can, and, and it creates a safe space for showing shame. Mm. 
And in that context, you have enough trust, you could even share your mistrust. You could trust the other with your mistrust if it arose. Wow. And shame um, is not always toxic. Yeah. Many people see shame as just this bad thing. I see that it's, there's unhealthy shame, there's healthy shame. Healthy shame triggers our conscience, makes us want to make amends, clean up the mess we've made. And if we didn't feel that shame, we probably wouldn't. Our right. conscience wouldn't kick in. Unhealthy shame is not activated by via conscience, but by our inner critic. It's just taking you down. There's no heart to it. There's no care, no love. It's just simply an attack, and it's based on the shame you got as a kid from parents, siblings, teachers. And shame is, is probably the most hidden emotion in psychotherapy and spiritual practice. Yeah. It's just not, it's not noticed because it mutates so quickly into other states. Mm. Most people, when they feel shame, want to get away from it. They can get aggressive internally or externally. Then it looks like they're only aggressive. The shame has been, is now in the shadow. Or they can dissociate. They can withdraw, get numb. Again, the shame is not out front. It's hidden. Mm. And what I'm teaching men, especially in the, in the work I'm doing, is how to sit in their shame, in the fire, because shame is a bit of a fire, in the fire of their shame without losing their dignity. Mm. Not hanging at, oh, what a bad person I am, beating themselves up, which is the essence of guilt, self-flagellation. Instead of that, they sit there, and I have them keep eye contact with whoever, it could be me or some other men or women, and in that, they get to say what it is they're ashamed of, and they may break down with it, but they sit tall. You don't have to cringe or grovel Many people associate shame with humiliation. The real transition is from humiliation to humility when you're working with shame. But it's worth knowing. Once uh, uh, our shame has been penetrated and we see it for what it is more, then we can get angry in a fuller way. We can cry more deeply. And I teach many people how to work with their inner critic. So the inner critic does not run the show. It's part of us, but they learn to relocate it to the outskirts of their psyche instead of letting it dominate them. Instead of giving it a loudspeaker. Wow. Yeah, I can definitely say there's been p- p- times in my life where that inner critic has ha- has been running the show. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's true of a lot of people, right? Where and, and it's debilitating if, if that if that's the case. Mm-hmm. It is. And some people are actually are suicidal because the inner critic is not just this relatively nasty voice. It's actually de- there to take them down. I wish you'd never been born. You should not have been born. You're an awful human being. And it's this loud, constant nagging inside their head. Once they realize that's not them, it's an implant, literally an implant, something that was taken on maybe to age two or three or whatever, they can start to work with it. And when it arises, then they can say, I'm not you. That's the realization, I'm not you. Or they can shift their awareness to their body. There's many ways to work with it, but the worst thing we can do is just to let it have its way and then we don't get between it and our inner child. We let the inner critic just hammer the child. Then we just regress and we feel powerless and we feel like shit. So that's part of working with shame is working with the inner critic and learning that there is a healthy shame. There is a healthy shame. And that allows us to say if you've hurt a partner, if I didn't have that, I could hurt Diane and just I'll say that's your problem. You know, you, that's your stuff. You know, so, you know, work with it. Yeah. Instead, if you're able to say, "I'm sorry, my God," you, you, your empathy hearts, your empathic heart opens. You realize what you've done, and of course, you say you're sorry. And maybe you change a behavior somewhat too. Saying you're sorry isn't always enough. Sometimes you have to change a behavior so you don't get into it again and again. Mm. It, it, it's it's wild because I, I, I'm thinking of that inner child and shame. And as you were talking about that, I had almost like a metaphor of like a garden and the critic becoming like weeds. And if you don't if you don't mind them, intend to the weeds, the, the, you know the sun, mm-hmm. the sun the sun blocks out that that flower that flourishing of the inner child. But because the shame has just run rampant, and I definitely have felt at times in my life where that's been a pl- and I know it, that's the case yes, for many. And many people will believe the inner critic's words; they'll take them literally. That's because they fused with the child. Now they're <clears throat> they're, <clears throat> they're sensing reality through the child's eyes, and the child's believing what's being said. Mm. Whereas if you're in between the two, you can take care of the critic and, and pr- protect the child. Like I often say to people when we're working with inner child stuff, two things: love the child, learn to love the child. And to protect that child, mm. know that you have it in you to protect. And what? I think children, children that, that feel the safety of, of the adults around them, protecting them, do way better than children that don't feel safe. Yes. Yeah. How do you protect the inner child? Or 
I don't know if reparenting is the right way, but if you if you've had and I know many people have, unfortunately, had have have had traumatic experiences in youth. I've had it as well. Like, how do you reparent that inner child such that they feel the safety of the now? Well, first of all, you don't fuse with the child. You relate to the child. So you yep. recognize, the, here's the child. I feel what the child is feeling, but I'm not, I'm not the child. Then you're relating to the child, not from the child. Mm. <clears throat> in that context, then you can bring in your healthy anger. To enforce the boundaries. Yes. Someone, someone's, someone actually hurt that child at one point. It's almost like you're going back into the, into your history, and you're walking in there as yourself, and you're picking up that child, taking her out of that him or her out of that dark room, or getting between them and the and the violent parent. You're doing that, and it's not just a theatrical process. It's very emotional. Mm-hmm. You feel it deeply. And then you're, you're, you're starting to protect what's sacred and young and pre-rational in you. You take good care of it. Like when you're on the mat with me the first time, you're crying your guts out. Say, but you're also it's not just your tears as the current Michael. It's also that very young Michael. Yeah, he has he he has a voice and he gets to do this and he's safe to do it. No one's going to step in there and try and stop it. So we become a safe place for our child, whatever his age or ages, to act out. Yeah. See, the childness isn't just a certain age, like four or five. The childness can be six months old, it could be a birth, it could be five, it could be seven, it could be an early adolescent. After a while of doing this, we can identify what age we're at and feeling what we're feeling when the child kicks in. Beautiful, beautifully said. Uh, it, it actually brought me back to, for a moment to the work we did together, and it's it it, 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 it it's beautiful to be relating to it, but not be in it, so to yes. speak. I, yes. I, I, I like how you state that. There's another. Uh, passage of your book, which I actually uh, just want to, the second, this is the last one I'll read uh, for, for this call, but um, it, it, it really resonated with me. And you said, healing can be seen as the full bodied resurrection of a wholeness that honors the uniqueness of each of its parts without any letting, without letting any particular part dominate or govern the rest. And I, I so yeah. love that because it, it, it it's kind of to that point where you're saying where it's like you're you're not letting one part of yourself run the show, yeah. but rather starting to uh, both see the wholeness of it all, but in some mm-hmm. ways catch like like meditation, catch the distance and the reactivity of yes. acknowledging yes. where things are coming from. Yeah, you're 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 not uh, identified with any particular part. You're more busy being the whatever contains all of that. Yes, which is more a truer level of yourself. It's like being a, having a dream. And realizing the dream, instead of trying to act out all the parts of the dream, say you have at night, you become the space that holds all those parts. Space is part of the dream. Without the space, to, or these parts couldn't flow and move. There'd be no, it just wouldn't work. So it's a shift. It's a shift in perspective. And when we work in ourselves, we're learning to cultivate multiple perspectives. So you're not lost in the boy. You're also not distanced from him. So it seems like he doesn't exist. You're aware of that energy. You're aware of the inner critic. You're aware of. Uh, younger versions of yourself, you're aware of your me-centered tendencies where you're selfish, you're not such a great guy. You're also aware of your magnificence. And it's not a, it's not a dissociated awareness where you stand way, way back and are looking at this. It's intimate. It's intimate. And that's the art, how to be intimate with all of this. And it's the never-ending process. You don't arrive on it, okay, now I'm intimate with it, now what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What 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 you talk a bit, and I'll wrap it up out of respect for your time here shortly. But you talk a little bit about the steps to authentic intimacy, and I think intimacy is something that a lot of people are frightened of or don't really know what it means. Um, you, you detail it uh, significantly in the book to be a man, but can you talk just a little bit as as, as we sort of move to a close? What are the steps that people can 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 take? men, women, to, to start to approach that, that authentic intimacy within. Well, if you can't be intimate with something if you don't move toward it, mm. to lean into it. So the first thing is, to, is whatever you're being intimate with, a certain quality, a certain emotion, maybe a person, but you're, you're, you're getting closer to them. You pick up more data. You see more. And you also want to move at a pace where you can digest what's going on. If you move too fast, you'll recoil. It's like getting close to a fire too quickly. Mm. And intimacy is about relational closeness to quite an extreme. We have to also learn about fusion, which means we, we're not intimate now. We're, we become one with the other, and we, we lose our individuality. Mm. I often say, don't settle for oneness. Go for intimacy. Yeah. Of course, this is all one in a certain non-dual sense, but 
there's in, but intimacy is a, to me a deeper truth. It's bottomless. So you move toward it, you get close, and you always keep a little bit of a distance. So if I'm being really intimate with something, I'm super close to it, but I have just enough space from it to keep it in focus, to keep it in clear focus. If I get too close, I merge with it. It's like with empathy, people, you, you can get so close to someone else's feeling state, you get lost in it. So when I'm working, I get very close to people's emotional states, but I always have a very subtle empathic shield in place so I'm a, I can still operate skillfully. Yeah. If I get too close, I can't operate. I'm, I'm, I'm absorbed. I, I don't know where they end and I begin. That liminal space, that space between is so central to so much of what I've, I've heard you say in terms of even the parts of ourself or working mm-hmm. with other people Yeah. in terms of both the boundary but also the breath, if you will, that exists – in effective relation, relating, if you will, internally in terms of yeah, different aspects yeah. of ourself as well as those outside of us. That, that we're, that it we're is liminal. liminal. And it's yeah. liminal. It's, and it's very, very, it can be very, very slight. You can, probably can't even measure it. Yes. It's a bit like the space between waking and, and sleeping. There's a, the, that hypnagogic time. Mm. All these images come, we're sort of asleep, but we still feel our body in the bed. Yeah. And then suddenly we're asleep. Or when you wake up in the morning, there's those in-between things. This is sort of one of those <laughs> it's not. It's not that hazy either. It can be very precise. Yeah. Because then you, because you can tell you're in it if you have a clear focus on the anger of the other person. So if you meet a new woman and you're lot, you get lost in her eyes. There's a point you could be partially lost and still have enough space to just tune into her, or sense her in many ways. But you go a little too far, then you're fused. And then there's, of course, it's going to be a recoil later because no one, want, no one wants to give up their individuality like that. You get, you get too far apart, you end up what I call a co, not in a codependent state. You end up in a co-independent state. You're too removed. Mm. You've you've um, deified your independence, and beyond that is healthy relationship. Wow, which is int- intimacy, intimacy in the flesh. Highly recommended. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God! Well, I, I yeah, I, I could talk to you for hours, uh, my man. It's 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 such a it's such a pleasure, and I, my hope is that this won't be our last conversation. But I do want to be I want to be respectful of your time, and and also tell people you've written you know I think fourteen if I'm not mistaken, yeah. maybe yeah. more at this stage. But uh, to be a man is the book that I referenced in this in the beginning of this conversation. Yeah. But spiritual bypassing. Uh, what's the name of the shadow book? That's I'm going to read that next. I just found it. Ah, yeah, okay. <laughs> Bring your shadow out uh, of the, I can't read the bottom. Out of the dark. Out of the dark, okay. Subtitle, Beautiful. Breaking Free from the Hidden Forces that Drive You. Okay. So, I'm, yeah, that's my latest, maybe my last book. I mean, I'm, I'm writing now just for pure pleasure. I'm not aiming for another publishing effort. Well, I mean, you've done 14, and the beauty is I loved how you – you know, I, I think one of the things is we sometimes we forget the whyness of why we're doing things, you know, yeah. and I like your distinction of saying, I know what chapter I'm in. I know what I'm relating to. And I want to save my energy for uh, the deep work that I do. And you've even yeah. set the container where you're like, I know eight is good for me. I could do bigger. Right. And I think those that internal awareness is what we all yearn for. Right. It's like. The, the things we have that are most to me sacred is the time, which is limited. No matter who you are, we all have limited time, and our health uh, to ex- yeah. experience that time, and and hopefully, that, therefore, as I think about legacy, and I think about on my deathbed, my hope is that I have left the world slightly better than I came into it, and that I re- I had beautiful relating and experiences with the people I love the most. And mm-hmm. if I did that, I feel like that's pretty that's that's okay with me. That's pretty significant. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I hope so. What, 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 what do you hope? I guess I'll ask this as the final question for now. What do you hope your legacy will be? Same as yours. Yeah, would say what you said. Yeah. And um, and in, in, within that, there's my hope that the work I'm doing, the core level shadow work, is called that transformational shadow work. That takes off. I find I, I'm trained more people in it who can carry on what I'm doing. It's not a big number, but a certain number of people. And it starts to go mainstream. I get to see some of that before I die. Mm. If well, not, I'll just, I'm just doing what I can. Yeah. I'm good. I'm good. If it doesn't happen, I'm good. If it happens, but I do, I do give myself to this that yeah. way. You do. You, you, you give yeah. yourself all in. And I think that's the beauty, right? If you can live life on your edge with intention, but not expectation, 
Yes. Then I think and, you're you're dancing beautifully. Then you can homestead on the edge. <laughs> <laughs> Well, here's to homesteading on the edge, my friend. Yeah. If I can support your work in any way, shape, or form, I'm going to read the the Shadow book next. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I just am so grateful for you. You've been a, you've been a real. I want to honor and acknowledge you. You've been a real mm-hmm. gift to my life in terms of the deep work that you fostered. And uh, I just I knew that people uh, would benefit from learning of you and your work. And it's yeah. so, you know, I, my p- part of my intention with launching the podcast was I feel like I had had the rare privilege, whether it be certain Native American elders or, you know, this Ayurvedic ritual or, or, yeah. or our work together or my work with Navin. I just literally had someone tweet yesterday and it had thousands of likes of, you know, this, the podcast they listen to with my friend Navin, who also is, I, I kind of call mm-hmm. them, you, 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 these, these folks like yourself that are such wise experts uh, that just, I feel like so many people can benefit from tapping into. So I yeah. just want to honor and authentically acknowledge the deep service that you were to my life in terms of helping mm. me break through. Mm. And I'm so grateful to you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Thank you, brother. Appreciate you. Okay. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Robert Augustus Masters. I was uh, moved and inspired by his words and by his stand. I think his legacy will be profound. I'm so grateful that he took the time to sit with me. I'm so grateful for the work that we had an opportunity to do together. And really go check out his work. Uh, I'll link uh, to his site in the show notes below. But uh, Google Robert Augustus Masters. Uh, get the book. Get the books. I mean, he's written 14. But um, to be a man, a guide to masculine power is, a, is, a, is an extraordinary read for any man. And, and, and also any woman. I think it's... Uh, really a helpful tool in the toolbox and uh, i hope you got a lot of value out of the episode if you did please go ahead and leave us a rating and review on uh, on itunes it means the world to me and helps us build the community and move up in the algorithm um so grateful for this community um, and the feedback we've been getting if there's ever anything that we can do to improve or ways in which we can uh, be more of service you can, you're always welcome to hit me up at, at michael trainer i'm on instagram Facebook, all the social channels. And it's my great pleasure to continue to provide you with this information. This community means the world to me. It's uh, changed my life uh, hosting this podcast. And uh, thank you guys for giving me the gift of your time. And I hope it's valuable for you. So with that, please go out there and live your inspired life.